start first, and then you had a question, or do you want to? We did, but no one was here. It, it's not official, so I mean, literally, the only person that has to be here for open forum is the chair. You, you should all try to, yeah, we should all try, because actually in our schedule it says 6.45, right? Did you still have a question? No, okay. All right, Mr. Clerk, it's uh, seven o'clock. I call this general committee meeting to order. Um, before I, I continue, um, um, Councillor Humphreys uh, will be running a bit late, and since she, she's supposed to be chairing this meeting, um, I figured I, I'll chair this meeting unless there's any objections from council. Is everyone okay with me chairing the meeting until Councillor Humphreys comes? Okay. So I'm gonna get a motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Councillor Gilliland, seconded by Councillor Gallo. Any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Uh, declarations of pecuniary interest. Seeing none. Community presentations. We have one, Mr. Jim Thompson, representing the Aurora Tigers Junior A Hockey Club. Mr. Thompson, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Hi to the people I know. Hi to the people I don't know. We're good to go. Okay, thanks for having us. Is that on there? So this, I'm Jim Thompson. My wife and I own the Aurora Taggers. As some of you know, this is our captain, Stephen McLean, um, who's been a three-year player and has done amazing things for our community. Um, Tom will explain why he's here. Uh, later on. So what I've done is I wanted to put together a PowerPoint just to show what we are doing in the community and we can't have our hockey team leave this community. We're here on a positive note but we saw what happened in the Newmarket Hurricanes and we need the Aurora Tigers to stay in Aurora. So as you know we refer to the ACC as the jungle so welcome to the jungle Aurora. Teamwork, um, I will say this, the people I know in here have been huge supporters of Rita and myself. Um, we've lived in Aurora now for 11 years. Um, we bought the team five years ago and I can't say enough about what people in this room have done for us or we probably wouldn't be here anymore. Um, it just, we couldn't sustain it, but thank you for the teamwork that you've provided. This is our team this year. Um, we changed, you know, to some people were upset, but I love the Las Vegas colors, and I thought we needed a new, a new look. I was telling uh, Mayor Maracas that we've painted the room, our whole look down at the ACC's changed. So the Boston Bruins turned into the uh, Las Vegas uh, Knights. And then this is just some of the stuff. I know you guys see a lot what we're doing in town, but uh, that was our team two years ago. Um, after the playoffs, you see the playoff hair. Um, but, you know, any time that we're asked to go do something, whether it's the Santa Claus Parade, schools, if our guys are available, which in, in junior A hockey, like Stephen this year, well, th for three years, they will go. The 20-year-olds will go. Anything that we're doing, um, our players are always there for us. So most of you know that my wife and I uh, brought the 13 of the Humboldt people here this, this past hockey, hometown hockey. And I must tell you that it was, it was great. It was just great to a former uh, NHL player who's a friend of mine, Chris Joseph, lost his son on the bus. So that's how it all started. And then we got Tom involved and you guys involved. And it was five days of unbelievable happiness. I put the Don Cherry picture up there because you guys need to know that his whole day was booked. And I talked to his wife, Luba, and said, we're gonna be down at the Hall of Fame on this day. He canceled everything to meet us down there at the Hall of Fame and, and see these guys, because when him and Ron McLean went to Humboldt when the crash first started, or what happened, sorry, all the boys were in comas. So they had pictures on their phone and that, so it was a very touching moment. Uh, and I'll even tell you this, so Connor McDavid, a lot of NHL players went to the hospital, and what's funny was they were disappointed they, they missed Don Cherry, which, we can, we know why, so. And then uh, we did the uh, ceremony two years ago, but that was the picture, Tom, I think in the restaurant, right? Yes. Yeah, for your mayor's breakfast. 
We got them down to the Leaf Room, Mike Babcock, Brendan Shanahan, who I used to play with in New Jersey. We went down to practice. They took us in the dressing room to see the meeting. Uh, the, our taggers went with us. Um, we run minor hockey practices, so these guys volunteer. They'll go out, take the whistle out of the coach's hand and, and work with the kids in Aurora, which I love. Go play ball hockey at the schools. My wife and I have sponsored 2,500 t-shirts. So every year you come to a, the Oak home opener, we give away 500 t-shirts, something we love to do. As you see, Highland GM became our name sponsor, which really helped us financially. Um, it was good. Uh, I think I'm in school. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Cliff Sifton and, and Jennifer down at Highland, you were the Highland GM Aurora Taggers and uh, they've been very good to us. So just some more stuff, Rod Black at the, uh, the Hall of Fame, we do the Hall of Fame where these guys will go and sit all the people and give the green jackets out. We do the grocery stores for the mums, pack their groceries, um, take them out to the cars. I love that day when we do that. We go to the, the mall, uh, we spend hours upon hours, Salvation Army ringing the bell, what the guys love to do. And then South Lake is our hospital, so the money that we raise and the teddy bears that are for our teddy bear toss all go to South Lake for the kids' ward. You can see the schools that we do. There's the teddy bears. So Aurora Tigers are the only team in the OJHL to win two national championships in 2004 and 2007. And through when I say the teamwork now that Newmarket's gone and hopefully we can get more bums and seats, more sponsors, we need to bring a championship back to Aurora because it's big for minor hockey, it's big for the town. I'll just talk about the Humboldt thing, the electricity it brought with the great job you guys did for hometown hockey. So our goal this year will be to bring another championship back. This is really important, uh, Steve McLean behind me, our captain this year. Over the past two years, sponsorship dollars, the help of the town, 12 of our players got scholarships, and that's what we do this for. So we put a product on the ice at the ACC, scouts come out. We're gonna have two players drafted to the NHL this year, Chris Juraday and Anthony Romano, who played with us last year. Uh, Cam Morrison four years ago will be drafted, or he was drafted by Colorado, will probably be in the NHL next year. So this is what it's all about for the town of Aurora, these kids getting scholarships. How's my time, Linda? Okay, she gave me five minutes, she's like, Don Ron McLean. Um, this is an old picture of your old uh, Taggers. Um, Jim Rutherford, who's now was a goalie in the NHL, was the goalie for the Aurora Taggers back in the day. He's won three Stanley Cups, two with Pittsburgh, one with Carolina. We tried to get him here for the hometown hockey to come, but he was too busy. But Aurora needs your Taggers. Sponsorships, you know, I, I can only you know, in this room, the more, the more people we get on board, the better team we build, the more scholarships we get, and the better chance we have of keeping the team here. Because, you know, I love, the ga I love the game and all that, but the junior hockey, you don't make money, and it takes a community to make it work. So Highland, there's just some pictures of Jennifer and when we announced the New Jerseys and the, and the uh, sponsorship. And Tom and I met with John Taylor. Um, you know, it's official now that Newmarket is gone, so we are going to work with John in bringing Newmarket down to Aurora. We're even looking at playing Tom's idea, maybe playing a couple neutral site games to keep the communities alive, and I think it's a great idea. And that's it. So that's the presentation of the Aurora Tigers, and I want to thank everybody in here for everything that you're doing for us. Thank you, Jim. Uh, can I get a motion to receive the presentation? Moved by Councillor Kim, second by Councillor Thompson. Councillor Garner. Hi, thank you. Uh, that picture that you showed, what year is that from? Any idea? Which picture? The, the one with Jim Rutherford? The old newspaper picture? The one with Jim Rutherford, I think. Uh, 19, I believe it's 1967. So I have it at home, I can see it better. Because we brought um, the guys, who I think Michael was at that game, we brought uh, John Jacobs, who was original tagger on that 1967 game. My wife and I flew him in from Bolton, Alberta, uh, and uh, he came down for the dropping of the puck, and so that was nice. But I think it was the same team, 67. 
Thank you. I should have thanked you, first of all, for uh, reminding us how, uh, how uh, much you're involved with this and obviously how much you love it. Are any of the tigers from Aurora? Yes, so we had, when I say Aurora Newmarket, like my son played for the Tigers. He lived part-time in Newmarket, uh, part-time in Aurora. Three, three boys this year were from Aurora. As I said to Tom up in his office, we just, the, the, your minor midget AA team here in Aurora. So I coached the Aurora A team minor midget to a silver stick back in the day. We had some really talented kids that went on to play Junior A. And what we're trying to do is get more connected with the elite kids in this town before they go on to other teams. Or So to answer your question, we're, we're doing a better effort along with minor hockey who has to do a better effort and get this thing connected. So what happened was um, the coach of the AA team is now, he brought his team out to practice with these guys and some of their elite kids are gonna sign up for our camp and come to training camp. So that's the first year that we've done that. So I'm excited about that. Because we want more local kids. Right. You know, I want more bums in seats. It's obvious if we get more local families, we're gonna have more people in seats. But we still have to put a winner on the ice because that also puts bums in seats. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's what I was gonna say about community support. It helps when there are kids from Aurora. 100%, my wife and I are all about that. And the more Aurora kids we can get, uh, even new market now because you know they don't have a team. I look at them both as being. I know you don't want to hear that, but <laughs> one sign divides it, right? So as far as the hockey industry, you know they're welcome. So thank you. Thank You're you, Councilor Gardner. Councilor Gillilay. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for coming and uh, giving us this, this presentation. Um, there was so much information in there about what you guys do. Um, I thought it was really amazing sharing that experience with Don Cherry. Oh my gosh, like canceling all those appointments to come see you guys um, with the Humboldts and everything. How amazing is that? Um, the Salvation Army, like giving back, like is awesome. Like yeah. I don't think the public really knows like all the stuff that you guys do kind of mm -hmm. like at a local level, which is absolutely awesome. Thank you Highland, Highland GM for sponsoring the Sifton yeah. family to being involved. Like that is that's awesome because, it, again, it's very local. The symptoms have been, you know, an Aurora family for quite a long time. Um, you had mentioned as well um, uh, South Lake as well, which was really awesome. You know, they did that fundraiser, which was really cool. So oh, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're just just continuous and growing and harvesting and, and getting together and just creating that community hub. And as Council Gardner was saying with, you know, like obviously the more Aurorians you can attract, the more bums in the seat that can yeah. support the community and keep people coming out and watching these games and bringing people up and being supportive. You had mentioned um, about all these scholarships and I think it's really important to people to know like there is a lot of opportunity and a lot of talent here. 12 scholarships. Yeah. That's huge. It is. It is. That is yeah. huge. Like there's a lot of talent in here and I was hoping maybe you could um, kind of maybe talk a little bit about that a little bit more and you had mentioned about some I, I, I was writing so much stuff down I couldn't keep up but you had said something about um, some people had made the NHL and I, I, I don't remember how many people you said but if you can just kind of remind me about how many people are on the NHL that had come from um, this league and just maybe just highlight a little bit more about these scholarships and that opportunity. That's a good yeah so we've we've uh, identified 20 or more current or sorry players from Aurora Tigers who've played in the NHL, Jim Rutherford being one of them. The latest crop um, of these young kids, Cameron Morrison is from Aurora. It was a shame the year we bought the team that he went off to the USHL because he would have been the first Aurora resident to be drafted to the NHL. Wow. But, you know, he's gonna play in the NHL. Our, our two young kids from last year who deservingly go to the USHL. It's like the OHL for the states. And then what they'll do, they got full scholarships to Western Michigan and Clarkson. And Clarkson. So they will be drafted this year as, you know, their, their USHL team, but the Aurora Tigers in the NHL draft. So, um, you know, we have more young kids coming up. And Michael Palandra, who played in the under 18 national game out in Alberta. So there's a lot of talent that comes from our team, but to touch on your uh, comment there, just so everybody in this room knows, it's not, a, it's not in concrete fact, but they say that the Aurora Tiger organization does more in the community than any other 
Junior A franchise. That's what people tell me. That's what my commissioner tells me, that we set a, a standard for everything we're doing, which some people know on social media, some people don't know. But when my wife and I bought the team, being a former NHL player, I said, we are going to run it like a pro team. And Stephen will tell you, being here three years, these players are constantly in our community. So, I, you know, we were just at a school there yet. Was it yesterday? Yeah, I'm getting older, it was yesterday. So we went to a school, we go there, we do a great presentation where, you know, we talk to the kids about bowling, about, um, you know, eating property, all these different things, what these guys are doing and, you know, leave them, you know, I call it planting seeds and, and, and I kind of like bragging about this because I, I take the grade eights in the back of the gym and I tell them they're the, the backbone of the school and we only got a couple months left and make sure that you're taking care of these young kids up here and it's important that nobody's bullying each other and yeah. being, you know, be nice, be nice. And, and then I wake them up because I said, next year, you're gonna be the young ones in high school. And just remember how you treat these young ones is how you're gonna be treated next year because karma's gonna, and, and it's funny how they all, yeah, you're right. So I know, I know we send a good message when we do these school visits. And then as you saw in the presentation, we'll go in and do ball hockey tournaments and reading buddies and all that stuff. So it's, it's uh, rewarding. Councilor Gallagher? Um, yeah, and just one more comment. Um, you were talking about um, moving on and mentoring with um, kids, I guess, developmentally. And I just wanted to know if, can you expand on like how the public or general residents of Aurora would know how they can take advantage of that? Um, good question. So our VP of Hockey Operations, Tim Armstrong, who played for the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, he, he talked to me this morning about let's get a program going to de start developing. You know, there's different hockey schools in town, but we need to get more engaged in helping develop our local talent. Um, apart from outside, you know, the Murphys who live here have a great hockey school. Um, but the Aurora Tigers need to get more involved to work with these local kids to get them to our team, almost like a feeder system there. We have to get engaged with them. So we, we organize them. Instead of going off and playing AAA, stay here, play AA, build championship teams, and let those kids graduate to our team. So this guy here I found at a, at a prospect tournament. He played AA for the Aces in Toronto. Came to the Tigers training thing for the summer and made our hockey team and it was the captain this year. So it can be done. He's living proof of it right here. And he gets a scholarship on top of it. Wow. And I tell all the parents that if you can get four year scholarship and let your kid go play hockey, you've, that's your NHL. You've won already. So that's our goal. But it's a great question. That's where we talked about it this morning. Perfect. Yeah. Councilor Gillen? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate your, you coming here and sharing this with us on the residents, and uh, really appreciate you being here. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you, Councilor Gillian. Councilor Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and, and to Rita as well, and to all the players for your engagement and involvement with the community over the past year. Um, you've certainly touched on lots of different things that uh, the Tigers have done with kids and in events, but you know, I also know that it goes beyond that. I was with you and the Tigers at the Pita Pit to celebrate their opening, and uh, I know that uh, whenever called upon, you will certainly help, be it the business community, the kids, whatever. But if there is somebody out there that's interested in, in talking to you about uh, either sponsorship or getting the Tigers involved in a, a specific event, how's the best way to do it? Just to pick up the phone and call you or how does yeah. it? Yeah. With your permission, I brought some books. If I can leave books here, is that? Sure. Yeah. So, playing with Gretzky always taught me, think of play ahead, right? <laughs> so these are, they were just printed today one of our local sponsors, Quick Copy. So all it is is just a, similar to the PowerPoint and it's got sponsorship packages in the back. So, or my phone number's in here, Michael. So, you know, anybody that can, can drum up interest, we re, my wife and I really appreciate it. It's almost like I gave you an assist on that, uh, that <laughs> meeting, right? <laughs> I, I was gonna ask Tom and I was gonna ask Linda when we got here, because I didn't come here to solicit you, believe me. You know, we, we, we do fine on our own. But you know what, I've never had a chance in front of council just to say, you know what, we need this team to stay here. And you know, for Rita and I, we love it, but we don't wanna lose money every year. And that's why Newmarket got bought and they moved. They just couldn't sustain it. And 
you know, uh, it's it, we just we need to work together to keep our te hockey team here for minor hockey and everything. So any any help, we appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Gallup. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, and reiterate, you know, all the the thanks for everything the Tigers have done for the community. Um, I was just trying to sit here and think about some of the things you said, particularly putting bums in, in seats. And, um, and I don't want to put another thing on your list of many, many things I'm sure you do. But if um, we all, for most of us, some more than others, have social media, you know, uh, and we love to, to promote the town. Um, and maybe it's just me that I'm not necessarily in the loop, but if we could get a communication from you at least to council before a big game or before a game, any game, um, I'm happy to, to spread it out there and put it to everyone that, uh, that I can communicate with and, and see if we can um, get more bums in the That seats. would be, so. to see that there, you know, social media is amazing. Um, and I appreciate that because like I, I, there's a saying all hands on deck. And I, if I could talk about John Taylor, am I allowed to do that? Because sure. he made well, you know, I, mean, I, I sense the. Sorry, little, we, we won't hold it against. I mean, you they that did beat us. The they did beat us in the playoffs, <laughs> right? Did, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, John made a good point in council. So, somebody on council said, "Do you guys hear that we're losing the, the hurricanes?" And he's like, "Yeah, like they're this is this is real." And they're like, "Oh, I love them. I love them. I love them." And then he asked that person, he "Goes, when's the last time you've been to a game?" So I don't expect you guys to come to the games, but the more we talk, the more we put it out there, the more buzz we get. Um, did I talk about the ticket prices? No, no we didn't. talked upstairs. Yeah. So we made a mistake because you're, you're trying to sustain this little business that, you know, and, and, you know, I always say this, my wife and I bought the business. It's up to us to run the business and try to make the business work. So what we did was we raised the tickets from $12 to 14 and what we found is we lost a whole bunch of our seniors, which really bothered me. Because I'd go every game and talk to these people that were season ticket holders for years, and then I hear they were angry that we raised the ticket prices. So this year coming up, we're gonna take them from 14 and go down to the lowest price in the league is $10. It's the only thing we can do, and as I said to Tom upstairs, you know, we moved it to Sunday nights three years ago. We, we're trying everything. So, we're gonna lower the ticket prices and hopefully that will drum up some you know, excitement. So you know, that will be uh, John Cudmore and the Aurorian are gonna do a big thing for us, which they promised us, which will be nice. And uh, there's something else I was, oh. So what we also do is we make 5,000 passes for soccer. Um, this is disappointing to my wife and I because we give all uh, people signed up to sports in Aurora a pass free to get in. So the kids don't pay to get in. They bring their pass, the parent pays to get in. But then we have a list, you know, when the people come in the door, and at the end of the night you have 150 people and you had one or two passes. And it just, I'm just going like, what else can you do? They get in for free. I, I'm gonna be talking to Joe and Andrea from Minor Hockey. We have, they have to do a better job. They got a thousand kids signed up. There's somehow some way you know, I understand families are in the rinks all week. I, I got five kids, three hockey players. I get it. But how can a hockey family not want to come to one game on a Friday night? And this would be an example. So we, we had a um, minor hockey night. So bring your team. They're in free. Like we had some specials going on. And we are thinking, okay, th this should be good. Andre and Joe, they did their part. Zero teams showed up. And it was so heartbreaking that we had all the stuff for these kids and we just, okay, you know, there's no white flag going up, we gotta keep going. So, and we will, we will keep going, but somehow, some way, we gotta get interest by lowering the prices to $10. You know, Stephen's mom, Susan's here, she goes to every game in every rink and she was talking upstairs about the rinks that do charge $10, there's more, there's more attendance. So we're gonna keep trying. Councilor Allen? Yes, just a quick email to all of us. Um, before a game or the day before, and I'm Perfect. happy to to, yeah. to push it out there. Do I give that to Betty? Who would I send that to? Yeah, you yeah. can send it to Betty. Betty, uh, and I would almost I would almost even suggest uh, maybe Jim if we if we all just get a schedule for the season as well. And we yeah, but even a reminder. Yeah, really, and I think yeah, a reminder really, really, really helps. You. Really I'll helps. remind you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, thanks, yeah. thanks, John. 
Thank you, Councillor Gallo. Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and uh, thank you, Jim, for coming out today. And um, every time I hear you speak about your team, it's, it's always seems to always about uh, how, not just making great hockey players, but making you know uh, the young men turn into uh, great young men and uh, uh, men who serve us, who serve their their uh, community and so forth. So you know, I really appreciate it that every time I go to the mayor's breakfast. Uh, Breakfast of Champions or other events that uh, uh, you're present. Can you uh, just give us, you know, knowing the challenges um, of owning a junior A hockey team, uh, can you just give us a little b bit of background as to why you decided to uh, get into uh, the junior A hockey business, given the financial challenges? Jim? Um, I have two boys that played, so I bought the team for my boys. I say that up front. Um, one, one got a scholarship out of Aurora, one we ended up trading up to the North Elliott Lake. So I actually almost bought a team in the CCHL, which was called the Canada Lasers. So I was prepared to drive five hours, you know, back and forth to run a little hockey team. And then uh, uh, a friend of mine, Enrico Lisi, and Benny Socia owned the uh, Aurora Tigers. And I just said, listen, if you're ever interested in selling, and Enrico called me a week later, says, I'll sell it to you, which I was just, because I was ready to make this silly trek to Ottawa every, you know, every week. So number one, it was for my boys, and I appreciate this. Um, when you're a former NHL player, and you see how some things go on, on hockey teams and organizations, uh, I think you can see in this room, I'm a passionate hockey guy. I'm a passionate father. I was able to give my kids a platform, and Stephen will tell you, there's no favoritism. It's not like, okay, this, you know, these get, the, it's not like that, they earned their way. But I wanted a good experience for my kids playing junior A hockey, and I was able to do it. In our league, there's a lot of father-son combinations. Some are good, some are bad. I'm proud of mine. Um, you know, my, my uh, son James was, a, a, like Stephen, a complete ambassador in this town. He was at every function, a uh, pretty good hockey player that got a scholarship. And um, so that was number one. Number two, I love hockey. And I was on the ice 53 years old. I was on the ice training kids this morning at 7 o'clock. Um, so I'm in the rinks. Uh, we Our training program, seven weeks, we're on the rinks in the summertime. Much to the displeasure of my wife, I spend my whole summer in a hockey arena, but that's the business, so. But yeah, that's, uh, that's you gotta have the passion for it. Councillor Kim. Great, um, that's fantastic, but did you say that you traded your son? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, that's, it's funny because, um, um, it just, it's, it's where he was, he was kinda, just you know what he wanted to get away from home he wanted to go and bill it it was you know he wanted he wanted to go play somewhere else and i i loved it he's just like you know what i'd like to go and so we traded him to elliott lake in the north and he loved it up there finished his career there you know and uh he's going to school at brown university and or brown college uh wherever down by uh, seneca there so yeah but yeah that was that was people that was kind of funny there, Stephen. <laughs> so it was a good trade. <laughs> yeah, it was a good trade. Great. Thanks, Jim. Councilor You're Kim. welcome. Thank you, Councilor Kim. Councilor Gartner. Hi. We're getting a little short on time, I'm but sure I wanted are. to uh, make a couple comments. The tickets were $10 forever. I mean, Vivian Bridgeford would know better than I, but for years they were $10. So I don't think it's taking the tickets up in price. I mean, you, you have to do that. Um, but um, with respect to the seniors, perhaps they could have a discount. They do. They their tickets went from eight to t no. Sorry, their tickets went from till ten ten dollars. They were eight dollars. So the two dollar raise for them made a huge difference. It's uh, it, it still sounds fair. It's a night out, but anyway, just my comments. Yeah, I it's 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 yeah. I I don't know what to tell you. So, but we're getting, like I said to to not to repeat myself. We will keep trying different things to get some traction behind our hockey team. We won't give up on that. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for coming out. Uh, you know how I feel about the Tigers. I, I mean, I, I think they're a staple in our community. 
uh, you know, as Councillor Kim mentioned, uh, yourself, Rita, um, not only do you, do you teach these kids respect, how to have respect, for, uh, but to be part of the community, and you also build character in these young men. And it's, it's, it's phenomenal, the work that you guys do. Uh, and I think that any one of us, when we come out to the games, we see it. The games are, I mean, it's great hockey. Mm -hmm. And I think people are missing out. And, and I encourage everyone to come out, as you know. Um, and, you, got, you know, it's phenomenal that you guys are everywhere. Rib Fest, schools, uh, you know, the sport, Sports Hall of Fame, grocery stores. You guys are everywhere within the community. You guys do so much for our community. And I, I think that uh, it brings so much value to our community to see these young men and yourself out within our community helping volunteering doing what they can to make our community a better place so i thank you i think council thanks you and i think our whole town thanks you for that i appreciate it can i say one more thing sure. just because i forgot one thing so we talk about the schools these guys are constantly volunteering their time to go into schools and tom knows this we had a school day and we did a school blast with enough time to do a field trip we had zero schools show up to our school day and it was an afternoon game, heartbreaking again, but maybe within this room we can figure out how to get just the schools involved, the little things, I'm, you know, but uh, well, that, one, of our, one of our counselors, I think his wife has something to do with schools. Okay, so. <laughs> so, but we'd like to do another school day next year, fill it with kids and uh, have a great afternoon, so something, but thank you. You're Mayor. welcome, Jim. And so we are here as well to um, recognize uh, um, one specific player uh, uh, they'll be receiving the uh, uh, excellence in sports uh, award from the town tonight um, and uh, you know maybe if Jim would like to just say a few words about Stephen I, I mean I, I will say one thing Jim before you you kind of give a little bit of a history about Stephen and, and what he's done and what he's done within the community uh, we were just chatting about the fact that uh, I have a lot of residents say that I'm everywhere and the funny thing is, is then I said it, I said it upstairs that everywhere I go, I tend to see Steven. Yeah. And so he's everywhere as well. And so it's, it's, it's remarkable the, the amount of work and volunteering he does in our community. And I, and I can't think of a better person to receive this award tonight. Uh, I, I'll just say this, Steven, this year he billeted in Aurora, he's from Scarborough. Anytime we had a function, he was there. He would drive in from Scarborough. If it was a school function, he never said no unless it was, but never said no. I knew I can depend on him. Um, Tom a asked me upstairs, you know, my biggest memory was this kid comes from Double A, and how many teams wanted to trade for him? And we never ended up trading him, which was a blessing to your town. It was a blessing to our team because he was a great captain this year. But he is just a, a cultured stand-up, professional young man that we were blessed to have in our town for three years because all the young people that he was around he he touched them with with a blessing of just goodness and i thank you for that it's been an honor to um represent the town of aurora with the aurora tigers and um i've had a lot of fun volunteering my time and it's never been a burden to come up here and I enjoy every minute of it, so thank you. Thank you, Stephen. So if I can have uh, you join us in the center, Council, if we can go in the center and we'll present uh, Stephen with the certificate and, and the pin.
So, yeah. All, so all those in favor of receiving? Opposed, that carries. Thank you, thank you guys, thank you. Thank you, Stephen, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> all right, we don't have any delegations, Council. Uh, nothing on the consent agenda. No advisory. Oh, yeah, we do have advisory committee meeting minutes. We have two. Uh, any, anybody want to pull any one of those minutes? Anyone have any questions? Councilor Gardner. Thank you. I'd like to pull them both like for just a, a question. Did you have just a question or did you want to pull them? Uh, no, I'll pull them. You'll pull them? It might be easier. Thank both? you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So we'll move to considerations of items requiring separate discussion or requiring discussion. And we'll start with A1. Thank Heritage you. Advisory Committee meeting minutes. Councillor, would you like to move move that to receive? Councillor Gartner, second. Councillor Thompson, Councillor Gartner. Go ahead. So th this is just a question, uh, maybe to all of Council, but especially to you, Mr. Durand, and I apologize I didn't call you in advance. The When the um, Heritage Advisory Committee met on March 5th, they, one of their items was the Heritage Permit Application. And a lot of us were at that meeting. I think it was pretty clear. They, they, they asked a couple times when the next general committee meeting would be. Uh, this was the first time they saw the actual design of the new building. And they did want their comments to come forward to that GC on the 19th so that council could consider it before we did the library square meeting on the 21st. So the question is how how could the committee have done that? Would they have put in the, um, when they moved the recommendation and it said uh, the following recommendations be incorporated into report to general committee, would they rightly have said um, the report to general committee for the 19th? So it would have come to council before we discussed, um, not only, well, we discussed on the 19th, we discussed the heritage permit um, and then we discussed on the 21st um, Library Square. So uh, just a word of advice there, how something, because the, from the 5th to the 19th, it does give, I think it gives enough time to come to a general committee meeting. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you, uh, with our uh, processes in terms of um, getting the minutes to staff, uh, making sure staff is okay, make, then the chair, then the committee, so it's three different sign-offs on the minutes. Uh, the two weeks wasn't uh, enough, especially with um, the agenda going on a week earlier. And, and one thing I will just point out that I think is important with the way the, um, the minutes and the reports are being written now is that when items do go to advisory committee meetings, the authors are using the advisory committee review section of our GC reports to explain in much more depth than the minutes allow what the committee thought of uh, a certain application, a certain um, matter before council. And so I um, rather, I would ask that council look more at the advisory committee review sections of reports um, rather than the minutes because that's where staff can describe more in detail what the, the comments of the committees were. That was going to be my second question, but I, I, um, and I understand exactly what you're saying about process, but in this situation where a committee has never seen the actual design and we know it's going to be discussed in council, maybe there could be a way to make sure council gets the comments, like we're getting it now. And it's long after we discussed both the heritage permit and the library square and the other question is um there's there are many comments but all it says in the recommendation is that um the comments from the heritage advisory committee regarding the following recommendations be incorporated into a gc report so are you saying that these actual comments don't have to be put into the motion? Because it's very clear when it says, um, the first one is about the addition to the subject property. The comments are very clear, you know, the, the concerns about the roof line, the style, the exterior building, building depth, stability, visual impact. So it's, it's a whole, good package of comments for council to know. So it doesn't need to come into the 
the uh, actual recommendations. Mr. Clark. Three, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, not in my opinion, it doesn't need to go into the actual recommendations. Okay. As long as um, the author is doing a, a, a job or a job within the report summarizing for council, I think um, that you know, that is generally where uh, um, okay. these things would be shown. And I think um, it, so. It, the ideal situation is that the committee uh, provides the comments in a way that um, staff member, whoever it may be, this is what you should be thinking about in your report to council to give them a full picture of what's going on with a certain matter. Thank you. Well, and they're captured Customer. very accurately by whoever did the report. Um, just going back to the comment, we didn't have them before we looked at the heritage permit or the application or library square. Thanks. Uh, so we can vote on that. I got Councillor Thompson. Oh, so. sorry, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Through you to Mr. Drawn. Uh, Michael, it's my understanding that uh, the reference to ha having uh, records of any meeting, the minutes, without note or comment, comes from the Municipal Act itself. It's not a question that we, as a body, have decided. This is uh, a statutory requirement or a guideline, however you want to refer to it, uh, that meetings are without note or comment. So would it be fair to say that the minutes you're providing from the advisory meetings actually go beyond that because they do provide a little bit of a framework but for the most part you're really just following the municipal act which i'm sure all of us are very well aware of mr clark through mr chair i i would agree with councillor thompson's assessment there we we take it a bit further i think we're still fine within the provisions for how we do it um you know we'd certainly stop short of specific comment from a member but um, I, you know, so I think um, you know, we've, we take it just about as far as the Municipal Act will allow by providing a sense of what the discussion topics were at the meeting, but like I said, not any individual note or comment. Thank you. Councillor Thompson? Thank you. Councillor Gallo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a question about um, item three, the uh, request to remove a property from the Aurora Registry of Properties of Cultural Heritage or Value 1525 1675 St. John's Side Road. I um, saw, and, I, and somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, on a social media post that that property has been uh, demolished. Um, and I found it a little strange that it was, it was here, it's being requested to be removed, and is now demolished. So just a heads up to whomever um, that someone should be looking into that and finding out how, how that happened. No, I, I, and I'm, I'm, not sh I'm not sure because I, I was just there to, uh, yesterday, last night at the meeting to to uh, welcome and, and thank uh, all those that put their names forward and are part of the committee, and I left. But I do believe that they discussed, they might have discussed this last night as well. So I'm not sure what occurred. If Councillor Humphreys was here, she's, she's on the, she could probably give us a little bit more of an explanation. Um, and I'm not sure if any other yes, staff, oh, staff, was Mr. Waters yes. there? Yes, yes. He, Mr. Waters there, maybe you can give us a bit of an explanation. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Councillor Gallo is quite correct. The, uh, the property is no longer, or the dwelling is no longer there, or the barn. Um, it was removed um, uh, within the 40th day of the 60-day uh, period where um, it was um, the demolition permit had been applied for. Um, they had to wait to the 60 days, but they actually demolished it within the 40th day. Um, I've advised the CBO of that, and uh, we will be adding a surcharge to their demolition permit uh, to cover the, uh, the dwelling uh, removal prematurely. Councillor Gallo. So was approval, sorry, through you, uh, was, was approval given to demolish? Mr. Waters? Through you, Mr. Chairman, there was a 60-day waiting period before the permit would be issued for demolition um, because it was a listed property. Um, so the, um, the owner of the property prematurely demolished the, um, the, dwell, or the barn, I believe, without the proper approvals. Councilor Gallo, I am. I'm not sure if you're aware. I think you are, but just in case. Um, so if if uh, if an, if someone puts forward a, for a demolition permit that for a listed property, um, there's basically there's a 60 day time period, and if if the committee or if council does not make a decision on whether they delist that property to allow that demolition to occur after 60 days, if there's no decision, they automatically get the approval on that demolition permit. So I guess my question is, where where are we? Where is the town? What's the town's perspective within those 60 days? What did we do? Are, are we? I saw it in the committee, and, and but did did. Was there no opinion? I think it was still at the committee level, and they still didn't render a, a decision yet. Uh, Mr. Waters, is that correct? Or um, Through you, Mr. Chairman, um, I believe the staff did support the delisting, and there were some conditions regarding its removal, 
Um, um, for instance, I think saving some of some of the uh, the stonework for a plaque, um, and I believe also um, uh, recognizing its equestrian heritage um, uh, through the street naming and also a view study uh, through a development application. Um, those are conditions that the committee uh, did uh, support uh, based on staff's recommendation. But however, as I said, the um, the owner of the property uh, prematurely demolished it to the barn within the f uh, within a 60-day period. But it's still a listed property. Council has never delisted that that property. So uh, a property that was listed has been demolished, and all they're going to get is a fine. That's pretty sad. Councilor Garner, before I go to you for a second time, um, I'm I'm not going to disagree with you, Councilor Gale. I think it's very disappointing. Um, Mr. Waters, is there is there anything, or should I? I don't know if I should be asking this to Sarah. Is there anything that the town can do in this instance, other than just giving a, a simple fine? Um, to you, Mr. Chair, it's something that we would have to look into further. Uh, we, as the town, wouldn't be able to do anything, but if there were. Like I'd have to look if do we can charge or something, and then it'd have to go through the whole process. And then if they do demolish and it's um, without approval, then there is a bigger fine that the Ontario Heritage Act does allow. But I'd have to look into all that. Thank you. I, I would appreciate if you can look into that because I think that this is concerning. I think for all of us sitting here, I think uh, we value our heritage, and uh, I think it's something that we need to ensure that people don't jump the gun, so to say, and, and decide to take matters into their own hands. Or, you know, uh, we said many times demolition by decay. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, you, you see it time and time again, and so it's something that we need to discourage and make sure that there, there are proper fines in place that allow us to discourage this from ever happening. So, um, Councillor Tom, Councilor Garner, did you want to speak again? Or did you want me to go to Councillor Thompson for the first time? Oh, no, it's the second time, actually. So, Councillor Gardner, go ahead. Councillor Gilliland. Oh, her name just came up. Councillor Gilliland. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor. You guys are pushing those buttons quick. <laughs> um, I just kind of wanted to echo what you were saying, Mr. Mayor, that um, I really do believe there should be a process in place. So if someone does decide to inadvertently just go oops and push something over and demolish, like what kind of happened, that we need to have some sort of policy in place to to make it not encourageable for someone just to pay this fine and move on. I don't know what that looks like, but I don't think it's something that we should take lightly, and I think it should be something serious, and we really need to look at the uh, monetary um, consequence of that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gillan. Councillor Gardner, did you still want to speak? I do, I agree okay. with you, and um, to our um, Director of Building and Planning, uh, under which this falls, I don't know if somebody applies to delist a property, um, are they completely, do we make them completely aware that the Heritage Committee has to do an evaluation and they can't demolish it before a certain amount of time? We should give them warning up front. Maybe we do. Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, through the demolition permit application form, they would be advised of any timelines associated with uh, demolition. Um, so, um, okay. I, you know, pleading ignorance, I don't think, is, is an excuse here, to be quite frank with you. Um, um, and uh, just, just to sort of uh, um, give you sort of a picture of this staff, we're recommending that the property be delisted, um, and an HIA was submitted to support that recommendation. However, um, because of the state of the barn and its decay um, over the years and its neglect, um, it, uh, it came in, it, it arrived in the state that it was. So um, staff had recommended that certain aspects of the, um, of the structure, the foundation be, uh, be retained through a plaque. So um, it's unfortunate that the, uh, that the owner decided to jump the gun, so to speak, because um, they would have, um, if they had gone through the process, they would have been able to demolish it after the 60 day period. Councilor Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I think the process is not only for Aurora, but for everybody under the Heritage Act, that when something's listed, there has to be an evaluation. So, uh, yes, this is a very unfortunate situation. Um, and just a further comment, um, to Mr. Duran, 
I, the Heritage Committee only got these minutes for approval last night. So I don't know, there seems to be something, uh, maybe it's part of the new process for committees, I don't know, but they really should have uh, be able to approve their minutes before it turns up on a general committee agenda generally. This may have been a, a slightly different situation, but is that the expect expectation that Heritage would look at their minutes and approve them? Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, not always. The minutes are up for receipt on always on um, committee agendas. Okay. And so uh, we do um, make the, the Heritage Committee aware before they um, are, come to council. Councilor Garner. So it wouldn't matter whether they agree with them or not, is what you're saying? Uh, well, we, we do accept comments uh, when we, we ask the committee, and uh, in this case, <coughs> um, the, the vast majority of the committee was fine. Right, last night. Well, Councilor Gardner, I, I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're aware as well, because when we sit on committees, the chair, the vice chair, and even some of the committee members, they get sent out the minutes and are asked ahead of time uh -huh. if there are any issues with them or if they see that there's anything missing or, or that they would like to add to that, and, and then the clerk would take that into okay, consideration. Thank you. And that happens way before the minutes even get to them onto their agenda as well. Thank you, and I could ask the chair if that happened. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Thank you. Just uh, quickly through you to Mr. Waters. You spoke a little bit about the application process and, and Councillor Gardner touched on it just in terms of making sure they adhere to the, but is it also clearly spelled out that, you know, failure to abide by these guidelines would be subject to fees and or penalties? Mr. Waters? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. I can't validate that because I haven't seen a demolition permit application. Um, I, can, I can circle back and, and confirm that for you if you wish, but uh, I would suspect that those kind of applications do have the appropriate clauses in them. Perfect. Councilor Thompson? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take it off one. Seeing no other questions, uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That carries. Next, A2, Accessibility Advisory Committee meeting minutes of March 6, 2019. There a motion to receive? Councilor Gartner, Councilor Gilliland. Councilor Gartner, did you want to speak to this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have a question on page five, number four, oops, sorry, number three. So it's about the inclusion charter of York Region. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's great that we're, Aurora is part of the charter. I wanted to ask um, perhaps through you to Mr. Uh, Durand or Mr. CAO, are there any um, responsibilities? Are there any requirements that council has to fulfill? Is there any kind of a policy or responsibilities that we have to fulfill as a town? And, and if so, what are they? And I don't need an answer tonight, but. Um, I, it looks like I can get an answer from Ms. Van Lewin for Oh, Ms. Van Lewin. Ms. Van Lewin? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, council did endorse a charter in the right. fall um, right. as there are 20 participating agencies in this uh, York Region inclusion group and uh, they vary from different municipalities York Region police are, are part of this uh, I think Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority there is a working group that's working on an action plan going forward there, there are no responsibilities for council other than to endorse and encourage inclusion and diversity in accordance with our with with the charter and the charter was signed by the former mayor and the CAO and we have the charter posted in all of our facilities councillor uh, thank you it, it, but if there are you know if we are endorsing something and it says you know do X Y and Z maybe we need to form a policy that says how we're going to do that because it's, it's just easy to endorse a charter but you know maybe we we need to as you said an action plan of actually how to do that thanks councillor that's all thank you any other comments or questions council seeing none all those in favor receiving opposed that carries so next up we have r1 council staff relations policy someone like to move the recommendation Moved by Councillor Gartner, seconded by Councillor Kim. Comments or questions on this item? 
Councillor Gardner. Could I, thank you, um, could I have on page 12, s the third bullet. So it says, uh, and we know when we get it, off, I mean, usually when we get an email from a resident, we'll refer it on to the appropriate department head uh, or manager. Is that okay? Uh, anyway, um, it says we have to obtain the written consent of the member of public. So I'm thinking that would be the email consent. Yes, thank you. Mr. Clerk, that's a yes. Councilor Gardner? Yeah, I saw the nod. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's, that's my it? question. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Councilor Gilliland. Um, yes, thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I had asked questions similar to that earlier offline to uh, uh, Mr. Nadarowski, so thank you for clarifying all that. Um, and although this is rather probably obvious to a lot of you around the council table, um, but to the general public maybe not so, but um, in the definitions on 4.0, it tells you kind of what everything means, and it didn't really clarify what had a council had meant. So um, I had spoken to Mr. Nadarazi, and he had said, it's mayor, I'm like that's great. For all I know, that could be the chair, it could be whoever, but it wasn't really stated in the, what those definitions were. And I just wanted to know um, th um, to you, Mr. Clerk, if that was something that you would um, think was appropriate to add to the definition when we're making reference to that. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, absolutely, I can def we can add the uh, definition of the head of council, and, um, and we don't need an amendment or uh, anything like that. I'll do that administratively. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Galloway. Councilor Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to um, confirm a few things on page uh, six of eight, um, I think this is new that um, members of council communication with staff on behalf of a member of the public, um, that first paragraph where, um, if I'm not mistaken, prior to, um, we would be kind of constrained to, maybe constrained is a strong word, but speak to um, uh, the director level. And this also allows us to speak to a, a manager level. Um, and I think that's a new thing, and I think actually that's a, that's a, a good thing. Um, but just to, to highlight that. Um, in addition, on page seven of eight, staff communication with members of council, that first paragraph speaks to um, that last sentence, uh, this policy, however, does not override confidentiality or privacy requirements that um, otherwise apply being if we're, we're in communication with, if we, a resident comes to us as an issue, we direct it to um, a staff member and um, whether for tracking, we wanna also be involved, provided there's no um, confidentiality for pri or, or privacy that we can still be involved from a tracking perspective. Um, on, on page 13 of 15, maybe it's just the wording and maybe it's just my ego, but um, members of council shall not attend a staff meeting or a meeting involving staff and members of the public without first seeking permission, maybe it's the word permission that I have an issue with, um, to attend from an appropriate member of the executive leadership team. And I'm just wondering if maybe we can reword this more from the perspective of if there's a reason why we can't attend, then let's stipulate what that is, similar to what was in the previous uh, paragraph that I said before, that there's a privacy issue and fine. Otherwise, if we're involved in a resident's concern and communicating, then we shouldn't necessarily be prohibited from being a part of, of a meeting or seek permission to be part of that, that meeting, unless there's a good reason for it. Do you want to, Mr. Sayo, did you want to answer that? See, Mr. Mayor, the intent of that uh, wording, and uh, first I'll point out that often this is, not, this is not to interfere with the casual sort of um, agreements that we may have on an issue to sit down with, with two people and have a discussion, but in a formal way, if a councillor approached a, a staff member and wanted to have a meeting with, uh, with a resident and the staff member, quite often the, the staff member is at a bit of a, they're a bit intimidated by the fact that they're the only other person in the room other than the citizen who perhaps has a complaint is a, is a council member. And, you know, officially the path for council to deal with staff is through ELT members on, a, on something where there's a decision or direction that's, that's trying to be achieved by council. So the permission, um, you know, may, perhaps we can consider softening the words. I get the, the 
point. It seems kind of like you have to, you know, beg per permission of the ELT member. The intent is more that the ELTL members are aware and ha provide the same opportunity to attend and perhaps, you know, uh, assist the, the staff member with the situation and, and provide that extra support for the staff member. So that's kind of the intent of it, that, that, that after the fact, uh, uh, the ELT aren't made aware of, uh, of something that, that, uh, that council wanted to specifically meet with the staff and resident on. Councilor Gallo? Sorry, I'm not sure I entirely follow uh, that train of thought. Um, I think, and just uh, I might reiterate, maybe this, from my understanding, is it's more, more towards uh, junior staff, not necessarily meetings with, with our directors and between our directors and, and residents. That, and that's, I might be wrong, but maybe Mr. CEO. And clarify uh, through you mr. mayor yeah and I, and I don't want to I don't want to bring it to a certain level of the organization it really depends on the situation and the gravity you know the gravity of the situation quite frankly so yes it could be a, a, um, a someone you know fairly junior in the organization that that um, that uh, might not be comfortable meeting with just a counselor and a resident over again particularly as it relates to a complaint um, uh, about service or something, they might want to get support of their manager or of uh, an exec, an ELT member. Um, but this is sorry, sorry to interrupt. But this, I mean, I don't think we should be meeting with anybody below managerial level anyway. Before it was only the directors anyway. Um, so, and and this is these are this is referring to meetings, um, and you know, requesting permission to attend a meeting to me with a manager or ELT. I'm somewhat bothered if anyone's feeling intimidated that any of us um, would, would give that off. I hope, I hope they don't. Um, to me, it's just, if someone wants to keep staying in the loop, I don't want to necessarily have to ask permission to be part of a discussion that maybe I brought to staff with the residents. I don't want to have to ask permission to, to be there, unless there's a good reason, like privacy or, or any of that. And if it is, then that's stipulated, and I'm perfectly fine with that. Mr. CEO? So, Mr. Mayor, this, this paragraph refers specifically to a meeting that is organized by a member of council. So it's a member of council that's calling the meeting and asking a particular staff member to attend. So it's in that context where we're saying, you know, again, we can soften the wording about permission. I, get, I, I understand that terminology might be, uh, we can soften that terminology, but I think the intent is that if a councillor wants to uh, call a meeting and wants staff present, that um, that ELT should be advised at least so that they can make sure that the right person is at the meeting. So in case the counselor hasn't got the right person there, even though that might be the person who, le who had the interaction with the citizen, it may be appropriate for someone else to support that staff member. So I think that's the, in the intent of it. Sorry, this is a staff meeting? This is a, a meeting generated by staff? For, this, this for, uh, if I'm reading the correct one you're referring to, it's request for staff attendance at meetings organized no, by no, member of council. No, this is the second, no, this the is second the, paragraph. Uh, members of council shall not attend a staff meeting or a meeting involving staff at, me at members uh, and members of the public without first seeking permission to attend uh, from the appropriate oh, okay. member of the executive leadership team. It's that one that I was referring to. Okay. It's, it's actually a, a staff meeting with a resident and we're, we need to ask permission to attend. Um, and particularly if it's, we're the ones who, who brought the issue to, to staff to, to deal with. All I'm saying is let's stipulate it in terms of why we can't attend, and, and which is perfectly fine with, with me, um, but I, sh I don't think it should be that, that restrictive that um, someone could, um, you know, we, we need to seek permission to, to, to be at that meeting. So maybe I can suggest we, we change the language. Mr. Sale? Uh, certainly to you, Mr. Mayor, we can uh, attempt to, first of all, I, I guess what I would suggest is separate the two, because I believe one of the other intents is that um, it wouldn't be an expectation of, uh, that, that a councillor would just show up at a, at a staff meeting, um, which is the first part, or a meeting involving staff. Well, it's, it says, uh, it, yeah, shall not attend a staff meeting. And then the other that I believe the councillor is referring more to is issue-based, or a meeting involving staff and a resident, members of the public. So, and I, and I get that distinction, but as long as we're comfortable with that distinction, again, we, I don't think the expectation of staff is that if uh, the, operations team was having oh. <clears throat> the operations team was having a manager no, meeting, I, that counselor would I don't want show to be up without no, permission. No, that is not what I'm suggesting <laughs> right. at So all. I think we need yeah. to separate them and clarify them. Yeah, I, okay. I, I agree with that. All right, thanks. Councilor Gallup? Good. Okay. Councilor Kim. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a couple of uh, differences uh, that I wanted to uh, get clarified between the the old and the, and the new. Uh, in terms of the the contact, um, in the in the old, we we were to contact the director or the CAO, and the, and the current has it that we contact the director or the or the manager. I know. I know uh, I believe uh, Councillor Gallagher may have touched on that, but uh, it is a subtle difference. But uh, through you to uh, Mr. CAO, can you uh, j just validate or clarify as to uh, the subtle change there? Mr. CAO? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, essentially, this puts in, in writing what is already the practice. In other words, when Council has an issue, uh, directors have always encouraged councillors to go to the manager responsible, particularly if it's to get clarification or to raise an issue with a staff member to, an, uh, to enable a, a more timely uh, response or a remedy of the situation. It's, uh, the previous wording was directed more at from the perspective of when a decision is to be made or when there's, you know, uh, councils sort of implying that they'd like a certain, uh, something done a certain way, then that should be done through directors because that, that is your your primary interface for making change, acting on a decision, you know, changing a process, that sort of thing. But this really just puts in words what is the practice, which we've always said is if you've, you know, as counselor, if you know the manager that's responsible and you know that there's a simple solution, then by all means, uh, you know, approach that manager. And we rely on the managers to, to say to the, a counselor, if it's appropriate, uh, that's really something you should address with, you know, my director, uh, because it goes beyond what I should be deciding on. And and that's worked all the time, so. Councilor Kim. Great, thank you. And there, there's, in, in the past, in the old policy, there was no um, verbiage with regards to uh, the types of requests that we're allowed to make one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, and in, in the, uh, the new policy, it says that uh, now it's divided into uh, routine and non-routine and non-routine is, or routine is uh, defined as something under two hours. Uh, so can you explain as to uh, how that number came about in terms of two hours as opposed to three or one hour? And would it not be best to maybe delineate these types of requests by maybe the type of request as opposed to the amount of time that it takes to fulfill the request? Mr. CEO? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, admittedly, there's uh, a number of ways to slice this. There's nothing, you know, um, unless the clerk has some some uh, ultimate wisdom on the two-hour number. But I think the intent is really um, that if it's something fairly easy for staff to do without, you know, throwing off their week kind of a thing, that we would try to accommodate that and get that information for council. And where it is something that is uh, going to be more labor intensive or involve multiple people, that uh, in order to not over subject ourselves to having, you know, basically seven people all, all giving all different staff all kinds of assignments, that we would have the option of, of saying, you know, this is going to take a, f a fair amount of time. We've said more than two hours, but I assure you if it was two hours and 20 minutes, I don't think you're going to get any pushback from the staff member. But it would enable us as staff to go back and say, you know, you really should get the consent of council because this is, this is, you're assigning some work here. So that's the intent. Again, there's nothing magical about the two hours. That's just sort of a, you know, it's a quarter of a day kind of a thing. If they could get it done in that period of time, then uh, we should be able to uh, provide council with that support. Councilor Kim. Okay, thank you. So I guess what you're saying is essentially, I mean, this is really not about the, the verbiage, more really the spirit of what you're trying to say is, you know, we certainly don't want to throw off staff in terms of, you know, th we already know we, we get, you know, biannual updates in terms of all the priorities that staff has to uh, uh, fulfill. And certainly with six councillors and the mayor, you don't want uh, a whole onslaught of requests that will throw off uh, all the priorities. So, you know, I, I understand that. So I just need a clarification. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kim. Councillor Garner. Uh, just a question. I, I had a resident who was having uh, an issue with her water billing. Her husband was not well. I said I would call staff. So what I did was I called the person in charge of water billing to get some clarification. And I um, think that might have been inappropriate. Or can I do that? Mr. CEO. Do you, Mr. Mayor. 
again, um, this isn't designed to be, you know, completely prescriptive in terms of defining those relationships or what you, you know, absolutely can't do. It's really, a, it's always subject to the reasonableness test. If it's a, a quick thing that you know who the person to contact is and you feel that that person can quickly give you an answer, then there's, there's nothing wrong with that approach. It, it's when it starts to get into a complaint, then, it, you know, maybe other people in the organization should be aware of that complaint. When it gets to changing a process or, or making accommodation outside of the established mm -hmm. rules, then maybe another level. So without knowing all the circumstances, I, again, this isn't, this isn't, I wouldn't want to say that that was inappropriate. It would, if it was oh. a, a casual kind of, you know, cooking the resident up to the right person in the organization that looks after that, that uh, work. Councillor Garner? Well, I, I think we're, if we haven't already all had this, this situation before, we're all going to have it. When a resident calls and says that their water billing is too high and they're, they speak to the water department and they're told, you know, the reasons for it, and then they go through their checklist and they've had the plumber and they've had this and they've had that and nothing seems to apply and they don't know what to do and that's how I got involved in that to see it, what could be done to to help the resident figure this out. So I, I guess there's a lot of gray areas but that water billing one we certainly all have come up against. I'll just I'll just have to use my judgment, and if so, if it's not acceptable, somebody will let me know. I'm sure. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Any other comments or questions on this one? Okay. All those in favor? Oppose. That carries. Next up, our two emergency management program annual compliance review. Someone like to move the recommendation? Moved by Councillor Kim, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Comments or questions on this one? Councillor Gardner. So, Mr. Mayor, I, I've raised this before. Um, I know we have a pro we have a team, we have a process, but we are the council, and if there is an emergency, we need, in my opinion, is we need to be in the loop because residents are going to call us. So. Um, I don't know if we could have a workshop on this, but, but we do need to know as a council, we, when there is an emergency, we, we do need to be in the loop and we do need to either advise residents or send them to the appropriate person to, to, for them to be advised. So in an emergency, you know, things, well, things are hectic. So I would like to know ahead of time exactly what we are supposed to do. Yeah. I have it's but it's, it's very yeah it, but it doesn't answer my question does it but we don't know what then what we're supposed to be telling the residents uh, counselor I'll just oh, sorry let Ms. Mackenzie Smith ah. did you want to through you, Mr. Mayor. Just in terms of communications, we do have a very um, comprehensive um, emergency communications um, plan. The mayor is the spokesperson for the town during a, an emergency, so all communication would go through him, and what we would do is we would ask council please to not respond to residents directly. Um, it can cause a broken telephone kind of uh, situation and um, becomes extremely, uh, can, can become extremely confusing in an emergency. So we would be directing all people to um, our website where we would have information or where we would be putting through information through our radio channels um, and the mayor would be the spokesperson and would be communicating with council what information is available at that time. And we, we go through this um, once or twice a year when we do our emergency response exercises, which um, we do in conjunction, obviously, with the um, fire service and uh, emergency management Ontario. Councillor Garner. So uh, I will reread the policy. Well, we're updating it, but I will reread it. But um, so then, f from what you're saying is that we should have no communication, or we should have no direct communication with residents, or if we do, we should tell them to look at our website for updating or to be in touch with the mayor. Through you, Ms. Ms. Smith. Through you, Mr. Mayor, what we would do is we would ask you to be sharing the information that is coming to okay. you through the mayor um, and that that is the reliable source of information. We want to ensure that there's only one source of information that is coming out in the event of an emergency so that it's reliable and consistent and everybody knows where the information is coming from and that it can be trusted. Thank you. And during that 
ice storm, not the last one, the one before. I didn't, I don't know what happened, but I had no service, uh, like no phone or internet service, so it was a problem. <laughs> I um, also have another question, which is, uh, um, I think in the budget we put some money towards a, a physical um, emergency center to prepare it f for use, but I noticed in that that we didn't have anything in there like for cots or water or just basic supplies for what would be in that center. Mr. CEO? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, I believe the uh, report that the uh, council is referring to was the one for uh, backup generators for um, um, emergency shelter, so that we had a source of backup power for those centers. Um, the provision of cots and those kinds of supports for that situation are provided through an agreement that the uh, Region of York has coordinated with the Salvation Army, and so we are party to that agreement. Sorry. Or, sorry, Red Cross, yes, I'm sorry, not, uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Downey, uh, provided by the Red Cross, and uh, so those services are provided by the Red Cross, they're on retainer from the region, and uh, we are a party to that agreement, so we would uh, reach out to them, and they would provide that, uh, that service, and we do drills with them, uh, we did one last year to uh, go through a mock uh, setup of one of those evacuation centers with, uh, with the Red Cross and our staff. Councilor Garner? Well, just as a comment, uh, I was at the emergency at the, the senior center was designated during that first ice storm. And uh, th the day that it was designated that night, there were no cots set up there. And they didn't come till the next day. So that's something somebody should look into, please. Mr. CEO? Uh, through Mr. Mayor, so I can't speak to that event because that happened you before uh, I arrived, but I can tell you that this was a fairly recent agreement. It okay. was brought to the regional single, uh, the regional uh, CAOs group uh, okay. about uh, two years ago as a, uh, uh, initially, and I believe now uh, all uh, municipalities within the region have signed off on that agreement and, uh, and it is being uh, coordinated by the region. So I think the response would be different today. Yes, that was before two years ago. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Gallo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question to Ms. Um, Serio, I think. Um, in terms of liability, if there's an, uh, an emergency, and um, I think I know the answer, but just to maybe to hear from our solicitor in terms of our personal liability, if there's an, uh, an emergency, what, what liability do we have? Ms. Serio? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to yourselves as councillors. If there's an emergency happens and could be disastrous and I don't believe you as a personally would have any liability but I'd have to look into it further unless Ms. Van Leeuwen wants to do the whole um, emergency management program and the act deals with the municipality as a whole and the town the corporation so personally well not personally for you personally, you wouldn't be liable. Councilor Okay, maybe we can look into it a little further. Maybe we can I, look I'd into like it further just to get some, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank Mr. you. Sarah, if you can look into that a little bit further and we can get a. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, absolutely, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gallo. Any other comments or questions on this one? Say none. All those in favor? Oppose, that carries. Okay, next we have R3, update on the corporate and community energy plans. Someone like to move, move this? Councillor Thompson, Councillor Gilliland. Councillor Gilliland. Thank you, through you Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanna say how excited I am about this report. <laughs> I don't know, maybe not everybody else is, but um, talking about um, infrastructure and, and pipes and everything else and I had asked Mr. Nadarowski about a bunch of things about the granting and I, I was hoping that maybe perhaps for the public and everybody else you can maybe explain a little bit of the background and, and confirm that we actually do have this funding because I was a little confused about the backstory and where we how where we came from and where we are now and I think it's really interesting and I think it's really important that we all understand how we came about this and confirming that we actually have this granting moving forward. Mr. Seale? Certainly, through you, Mr. Mayor. 
Um, so this, uh, the reason this is an information report is because uh, uh, the previous council dealt with this a uh, couple of times uh, in terms of uh, how to best move it forward. Um, we secured uh, financing, uh, or funding I should say, from uh, FCM, uh, I'm gonna say over a year ago I think now, um, and uh, it was brought to council um, for possibly moving ahead at that po point with uh, I believe it was 50% of the funding secured. At the same time, the Ministry of Environment was um, saying that uh, they would support these kinds of plans, but they didn't have quite such a, such a clear path on how to get funding. Um, and of course, there's been some changes and so on uh, uh, within that ministry over the last couple of years. Um, in any event, uh, Council decided at the time to uh, direct staff to pursue full funding and uh, try to get 100% funding before moving ahead. And so this is really just an information report to close the loop on that whole process and to report that we have in fact secured funding from both the federal and provincial governments. And so the, uh, all the work is, um, is, has been funded. Perfect, I, that's what I wanted to make clear. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Gillian. Councillor Gardner. Thank you, and I apologize. I didn't uh, read my agenda till uh, this afternoon. So this is a, a question for you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. CAO. Uh, Mr. CAO, we, this has quite a history. Um, Councillor Abel had a motion that the uh, terms of reference for community energy plan were to come to council for approval. Uh, after that, council had a report from our environmental manager, or perhaps Mr. Muno, that uh, basically said what this said, which is the terms of reference had been prepared and uh, either, I think, sent out. And I brought it to council's attention that Councillor Abel actually had a motion that said the terms of reference had to come to council. There's, there's no reference to that in the report and I don't know if it was part of the 2017 report. Anyway, um, at that time, we did decide that we wouldn't move forward with anything, that we would wait until the funding came in. But we still have a council motion that was passed that said the terms of reference would come to council. Uh, that hasn't happened and so I have the same concern I had I don't know, it's at least a year ago now um, that we never got to see the terms of reference. So, I mean, council can't pass motions and then not have staff adhere to them. That's, that's not how we operate. And that is actually what's happened. And Councillor Abel isn't here to speak to it. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, Nothing can be done about it right now because we've already put the the, the request out. We've actually secured the provider. Um, so I'll do some more work on it before the council meeting, but we, we absolutely can't have a council motion and, and not adhere to it. I, I'm sorry, Councillor Gillan, you weren't here. It's not part of this report, but it, but it was. It, Anyway, I'll look into it more for next week and perhaps, or perhaps we can speak because that can't happen. So um, I'm, I'm really happy about everything else. It's, uh, it's been a long time in coming. There was a lot of discussion around the table. I, I, I don't know who was discussing it, but uh, I think maybe Councillor Thompson was part of that about, you know, did we really need to hire a consultant to do this? Could we? Could we not do this ourselves, or, or look at what other municipalities had done because we didn't want to spend the money at that time. But now we have all the funding. So. Um, yeah. And I'll just add, we should thank Councillor Perry for the work that he did on FCM on that as well. Okay. To secure that funding. Okay, well thanks to Councillor Perry. I doubt that he's watching us, but you never know. Well, he's got nothing better to do on a Tuesday night. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, anyway, so uh, so that's my concern, and uh, I hope council shares it because we take a lot of trouble with our motions before we pass them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gardner. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, and and maybe the Councillor Gardner's concerns were raised in 2017, and, and I, I don't have access to uh, the, the motion that Councillor Abel put forward at the time, but the report referenced 
uh, in tonight's report back in 2017 was actually for us to award the proposal and we we stalled it at that time it had already passed the terms of reference stage the 2017 report referenced is for an award uh, for the proposal to develop that corporate energy plan and at that time we said no because we wanted full funding and so that's where this all got put on a hiatus but in 2017 we were at the stage of awarding it but we're looking to secure the funds so I'm not sure about that terms of reference piece because that would have dated even before that 2017 so I'm just going by the the report referenced in our uh, report tonight and looking back on it because that there was going to award it to end echo strategic consulting for $132,000 and we, we put a pause on it at that time. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Gartner, second time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one of the reasons we put a pause on it was because I raised the issue about the previous council motion. Uh, and through the discussion at the table, it was decided that it would be wise in any case to wait f for the funding, to find out about the funding. Um, but I'm pretty sure, and I will look at the report, I'm pretty sure that a terms of reference had had already, uh, staff had approved a terms of reference and already sent it out. So um, it's, uh, you know, I, I'm belaboring the point because council motions need to be honored. So I'll uh, put that forward for next week. Thank you, Councilor Gardner. Any other comments or questions on this one? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, that carries. Next are four, Heritage Permit Application, 7072 Center Street. Someone like to move the recommendation? Councillor Gilliland, second to Councillor Gallo. Comments or questions on this one, Council? Councillor Gilliland. Um, just real quickly, I did, I did go through the report and I never really got a chance to talk offline about this, so maybe through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Mr. Waters. Um, on page 51 of 54. Um, I mean, I like what, what's been happening with the design. I understand the whole concept of it, um, but it was, I kind of felt like this whole side of the building was really lacking any windows. It was like a really big wall, and I just didn't know if that was taking any consideration. Um, I know there's a bathroom upstairs. There's no window with that bathroom. I just kind of felt like with the heritage and keeping in, ch in check with everything, the front elevation, the, the west side, the back side, everything looked great, but this side just really looked like a commercial wall, and I just didn't know if there was, it's just my only feedback, and I was just wondering if there was a reason for that or if you can share any kind of input. Mr. Waters? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the report details sort of the, um, the restoration that is being proposed. Um, I'm not sure what facade you're referring to. Uh, 51 and 54, page 51. Page 51. Which is the east elevation. Um, what, through you, Mr. Chairman, what, what the report states is um, the, uh, I'm speaking to the, to the actual staff report um, on yep. page three of five, which is page three of 54, excuse me. Um, it does speak to the south and west facades, so which are the most visible along the streetscape um, and are in need of repair. Um, so I believe the, um, the emphasis is on, on that component of the building. Um, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the other exposure that you're speaking to. Councilor Gilliland. Okay, um, maybe I misunderstood. So I, I thought that they were wanting to build this build it back on the end of the house because they want to put four bedrooms for rental purposes. Am I wrong in that the fact that the extension is actually the back part of the house with the flat roof and then some gables at the on the end on the back side? Is that not what we're talking about today? Am I misunderstanding? Um, through Mr. you, Waters? through you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the um, the restoration is to bas basically remove the the garage, which is a non heritage feature. Okay. Okay, um, and which has no visual impact on the um, on the historic ambience of the streetscape. Um, it's also to remove the upper doorway on the east side. I think is what you're speaking about, mm -hmm. uh, which is to sort of uh, rectify the balance resulting from the veranda already being lost. I think there was a, a, randa, a veranda before, so it's to sort of provide balance to the uh, to the structure to the dwelling. Councilor Gilliland. 
Okay, so just because this is a, a new proposal for me as a counselor, I'm just giving feedback. Maybe this is not the appropriate time. It is the east side, and you are missing that door. I'm just wondering about the the guidelines, design guidelines, and maybe this is not the right time to be talking about that. I just felt like with the position and what they're trying to extend, that it, it looked like a, a rather large wall versus something that's a little bit more softened mm -hmm. within a neighborhood with some windows and not necessarily a huge structure kind of shadowing another an adjacent property. And, okay. and maybe this is an offline conversation. Oh. That's fine, Councilor Gillen. Maybe, maybe if you, you want to sit down with Mr. Waters uh, yeah. between now and next week, and so yeah. you can get a, a firm grasp of what is going yeah. on through this report and, and what's expected and, and yeah. answer some of those questions yeah. for you. That'd be Perfect. good. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. Councilor Gardner. Uh, hi, the, uh, the chair isn't here, so I, I've, I've tried to find out um, from a member. I, I don't ever remember seeing a whole report like this. Of, uh, this is, uh, from what I remember of the hack meeting, um, the whole report, we have the whole report before us. We've, we've never had that before. So um, I'm trying to find out why, Mr. <laughs> through you, Mr. Mayor, to Mr. Duran. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, you're absolutely right, Councilor Gartner. This, uh, we haven't put this on. Generally, Council used to approve the heritage recommendations through their minutes. Uh, so this is uh, an, an effort to provide Council with more information rather than pr approve recommendations through the minutes. It's uh, something that the we, that staff have worked on to provide Council the most information possible on a heritage designation or anything to do with heritage for that matter. I, I, think, I think that's terrific. Um, you know, we can't all go to all of the meetings, so um, unless you're <laughs> Tom Maracas. Um, but um, there's a lot of history in here. And um, it's, it's great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gartner. I'm saying oh, no other, oh. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, one more thing. To, to Councillor Gilland's comment, um, could we maybe have the the comments from the Heritage Committee because they, they're usually pretty thorough with with design and, and comments like that so that may actually answer the question thank, thank you, you. thank you counselor seeing no other comments or questions all those in favor opposed that carries that ends the items no notices of motions new business Councilor Gallo, start to my left. Go, Do you want me to go on that side instead? All right. How about, well, actually, how about I just, I'll continue and I'll get back to you. Councilor Thompson. Councilor Gardner, new business? I think there's a whole bunch, but I can't remember them. You'll give them to us next week, right? Oh, no, those are public service. Oh, those are public service. Oh, That's different. I'm going back then. Yes. Uh, new business. Yes. To you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Serio. Any progress on the sewer? Um, oh. update the sewer bylaw. Swimming pool, you mean? So the the swimming pool and hot discharge. tub water discharge. <laughs> Ms. Desario? Through you, Mr. Mayor, there's partial movement. Um, I did look at it, but I still would like to look at the videos of that um, evening. Okay. Thank and you, and um, I think there was a reference by Councillor Peary to the region uh, policy and um, actually it might even be in the report the the region doesn't have a policy on this so we could in response to the, oh sorry through sorry. you mr mayor in response to that question yes um, the region doesn't preclude us from having our own bylaw but i'm convinced that there was more to the story so that's why i'd like to hear the uh, tapes of that night councillor garner Thank you. And if I recall correctly, uh, Ms. Mackenzie Smith was involved in this, but she's, I know, got as many things on her mind. <laughs> um, I, I, think the, I think the actual report referred to that fact and that we could go ahead. Yes? Okay. Yes. yes. Do you have, but do you have the date of that report by any chance? Or maybe you could just email it to me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kim. New business? Councillor Gillen, new business? Um, yes, I was hoping I could get an update through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Van Leeuwen about the uh, new animal 
controlled by law with uh, in respect to sales of um, pets in pet stores. Ms. Van Leeuwen? There will be a report before general committee on April 16th, following week. Uh, the bylaw hopefully will be enacted. We uh, plan to do a short presentation as well to provide council with an update on our partnership and also a high level update on some of the provisions of the bylaw and some of the things that we're experiencing given the new announcement with the OSPCA and a number of things that are happening in the animal world. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Gallo, I've just you're you're good. Next week, okay. Next week, Councillor Gartner, one more. Uh, further to that comment, through I don't know to who, I noticed some really great trucks riding around that said uh, Town of Aurora Animal Control. I don't remember anything in the budget for that. Did we buy new trucks? Did we? How do we get those? They're really nice looking. Through you, Ms. Van Loon. We purchased a vehicle in 2018 when we brought animal control in house. So that was part of the um, budget of, for 2018. Through this partnership, our partners have paid for that capital cost. Okay. So it, you'll notice on the trucks, they all have all three logos, Georgina, <laughs> New Market, and Aurora. So it, it, yes, th those costs were borne through the partnership by our the other municipalities. Thank you. I no, just noticed the Aurora part. So it's good. We, we finally got some money from other municipalities. That's great. Uh, Councillor Kim, do you have one? Yes, thank you. Um, through you to uh, Mr. Downey is... Uh, is our armory, uh, is, is that on target uh, for, uh, for the fall still? Mr. Downey? Through uh, you, Mr. Chair, um, I've, I've attended uh, weeklings every week, meetings every other week. Uh, presently, we are, um, I'd say, about three weeks behind uh, our, our scheduled opening at the beginning of June. So it will, be, uh, it will be in the month of June. I just can't tell you whether it's going to be in the middle or the later part. Great. Mr. Thank Kim? You. Councillor Kim? Sorry. Thank you. No other new business. We have no closed session. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Gallo. All those in favor? Opposed? That carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, Council. Thank you, staff.